tap tool in uh, scope mode and make a dip into the ear. Um, pulling them down a bit more and just overall sculpting the mesh into a shape that I like. And like I said before, you're free to use every tool that you want that is at your disposal. Right, so as you can see in this front view, you can see that my uh, ears are smaller and that they are not located in the right position. So I'm gonna use this wireframe mode to relocate them a bit. And also I want to correct the depth of the ear, pull it a little bit more back so that it has a bit more volume right there. Again, I'm not worrying about the shape being perfect at this point. I just want to get all the base shapes in place. That's the most important part for now. And to help me get to this point and see what I missed, it's for me easier to work in color. So I'm just gonna use a viewport shading. Then with those in place, I'm gonna reuse the body mesh and delete the modifier or apply the modifier and say, grab another mirror and mirror it over to the other side so we can use this as the arms. Again, I'm switching a lot from edit mode to sculpting and then back to edit mode just so I can get full access to all the functionality Blender has to offer. I also try to look out for the flow of the objects flowing into each other and the flow of the object and matching the reference. Now that the arms are somewhat in place, we can go ahead and use a cylinder for the feet. I like to use the cylinder, copy the uh, material from say the arms, uh, go into edit mode and grab these top faces and with them selected I'm gonna use bevel to create a, a rounded cylinder. Do that again. With these shapes in place I'm gonna place them in the right position. Introduce some more resolution on the length of the mesh and then we can sculpt ahead because we need resolution to get the form we need. Um, I'm gonna bend the leg a bit more that's also helpful when you're rigging. I'm duplicating the eye mesh, giving them a new material and relocating them to form the nose. Using a bit of proportional editing and using a bit of sculpting, I get the shape that I need. And then I want to blend them together. To do that, I'm gonna isolate this mesh and grab a new rounded cube and shrink wrap that over the existing uh, mesh. And if you want, you can remesh the original mesh you're uh, about to shrink wrap, uh, if that gives you a smoother result. Shrink wrapping it on the other mesh will give you a lower density mesh so that your resolution around the whole character is more even instead of having some pieces be super dense that are remeshed, some parts that are larger having a bit less resolution. I just wanted to keep it a bit more even. That's why I'm shrink wrapping it down to a lower mesh. Uh, don't use this for a whole character, just use this for small parts. And also this is not the final retopology. And we can use this to project another shape on top of that that is gonna be the tip of the nose. And I'm just using a solidify modifier to give this some thickness. We're almost done, we just need some hands, some toes and some feet. Use spheres, cubes, appendages, whatever form and shapes you need to get those. Uh, in this case, I'm just using a rounded cylinder for the fingers. For the hands and feet, you can squash a sphere and stick some rounded cylinders in there. If all other shapes are in place, try to have the lines flow from one mesh into the other. Make the transitions between those mesh islands or individual blocks as smooth as possible. The next part is retopologizing. I know, why do we need retopologizing? We need a UV mesh and it's easier to UV or create seams in a low poly mesh than it is in a high poly mesh. Also, when we are about to rig and animate a character, it's easier to have a low poly mesh. So that's why I'm retopologizing this Muppet. I usually start with the face to retopologize uh, because that is usually the most complex part and it's just easy to get it out of the way. So let's dive right into that. I use a rounded sphere and just the half of it because we can mirror it over to the other side and make a hole into it because we're gonna need to have some more complex uh, topology around the face. Right, I'm using a rounded cube because I need these poles right here. So I'll mark them right here in pink. And usually these are good to use on a hat or a face because you can now easily connect the topology of the hat around the scalp. And I'm gonna duplicate those to the front as well. I'm connecting these poles back up to the existing mesh. And now we can use Ctrl and right click to create new points on the mesh and then fill them in with new polygons. For the part around the eyes, I just created a circle around the socket and then I create a big loop around these two circles that are the eye sockets and connect the middle part between the eyes as well. 
These loops are used in character animation because they will create better deformation for your animations. Again, there are loops around the eyes, around the ears, and also around the mouth. For this uh, loop that I created, I'm using the F2 tools and you can find those under the preferences add-ons. And if you search here on the right hand corner, F2, you can see that I have the mesh F2 add-on enabled. And if you want to learn more about what it can do for you, you can go over here and see the documentation page. Right, after a long state of retopologizing, I finished up the model. Uh, like I said before, the face is usually the most complex. The rest is quite straightforward. One thing I forgot to say is that a low poly mesh is also very handy if you want to use this or reuse this to create some clothing. Uh, think, just think about the nightmare it would be if this was a high density mesh and you needed to create, say, a vest or a sweater or whatever you want, a shirt from, the, from this mesh. Now it's just low poly and you can easily cut into the mesh and create some new, say, I want to create a Gillette from this. Uh, I'm going to delete this V shape around the neck and smooth that out with the loop tools. Then I'm gonna extrude it out to the top and to the sides using the scale, rotate and move functionality, sliding around some vertices, smoothing it out again with the loop tools. You get a gist of it, it's just basic modeling. To create this vest, I usually work at first with symmetry on and then when I'm quite happy with the overall shape, I can just break symmetry and pull one side over the other, add some buttons, add some other asymmetrical things like the pocket and the pochette. In the node setup, I created a new texture and I call that Muppet Texture Paint. And then just import it right here using that image icon next to the new button and select the texture that you have made. You can also create your new texture right there, but you have to import it into your node tree as well, just to be uh, visible in the viewport. That's why you do that. With our texture in place, of course, before we can see it, we need some UVs because we need to be able to project it onto our mesh. To create some UVs, you need seams. I know, there's a lot of steps to this. These seams are gonna be the, the edges that you cut so that you can unfold your 3D mesh onto a 2D plane. And that will make it easy to project onto this 2D plane your image texture. Right, like I said, you can select the edge loops or edges that you want, press Ctrl E or go into the edge menu and find mark seam. When you have all your seams selected and all the islands are completely closed off, you can press U to unwrap your mesh. There are several techniques, but in this case, just use unwrap. Uh, now that you press U and unwrap, you can see that we have in our UV editor a flat representation of our mesh. Immediately, you can see that our mesh turned black because the image texture that we not have painted on is usually black by default. For this Muppet, I'm gonna paint a reddish brown color fill the entire mesh with that because that is our base color. Like we did with the modeling part of the character, I want to block out the colors as well. I am gonna go into edit mode and for example, select a part of the mesh. Um, let's say the inner part of the mouth. With the inner part selected, we can go over to the texture paint mode. Sorry, the texture paint mode, not the vertex paint mode. But you can actually do the same thing in texture paint as you can do in vertex paint. Uh, with your selection, you can press this button right here and that will mask off your face selection or your vertex selection, right? And with that mask, you can now easily fill in the parts that you need. So for example, this is gonna be black. The outer parts of the ears are gonna be a darker. I chose a purplish uh, brown color. And you can work your way around the mesh, filling in those color blocks. When you're uh, happy or just want to be sure that you never lose this, you can go ahead and save your image from your UV editor or your texture editor and save it to a file location on your desktop. Now with this sitting safe and nicely on your desktop, you can go ahead and maybe use a different tool if you want to do some parts that are not so easy to fill in. Uh, you can use the brush tool. I found that the brush tool works fine uh, sometimes it can get a bit laggy if your computer or say the resolution of your texture is super high. I had some issues when it was a too large texture on my PC and just I wanted to do like big strokes or whatever. That isn't to say that it isn't fun to do, so try it out if you want. A nice little feature that the fill tool has is the gradient option. You can go ahead, select the fill tool and go to the color section right here and switch from color to gradient. And what I want to do is I want to create the stripes on the tail and I'm going to use the gradient tool to do this. Instead of using the gradient tool set to linear or whatever, I'm going to set it to constant because we need harsh and sharp lines between the uh, several sections of the colored pattern. 
A nice tip as well is that you can create a color palette. As you see, I have a color palette already created and you can just double tap the color that you want and with the stop selected, it will automatically fill in your color right there. And uh, now with your gradient pattern set up, you can just in the viewport pull from left to right or whatever direction you have uh, and pull and it will draw on your, um, your pattern. So that was just a nice little thing I wanted to share with you. For the clothing that we have created, I usually go ahead and just create a PBR shader that is straightforward and easy to do. However, I wanted to show you a neat little trick to recolor this texture. And the way I go about recoloring this is introducing a separate color node. Now, feed in your texture to the separate color and you can see that toggling between the red, green and blue gives us different results. I am gonna choose a mix node and set the mix node to color. Grab the green colors and you can see that it's just fully green because both of the colors are green. But when I introduce a new color, you can see that the texture will come through with these two colors. But this is not the result that we are after. I'm gonna use a math node. So shift A and introduce a math node. Uh, I'm gonna place the red channel into the math node and gonna set it to subtract. I would love to tell you that I'm completely sure what I'm doing here. I just also experiment. I just pick another one, say for example, the green channel and subtract it by the red. See if that result works for me and otherwise uh, change the color inputs. But luckily the green input works for me. First of all, I want to create a sharper division between the black and the white. So I'm gonna introduce a greater than node, set this greater than node to say a low value. I don't know, I have to search what the uh, threshold is here. And the threshold is about 0.03. That's uh, where I like it. And on a second mix note, I'm gonna change the uh, color to a golden yellowish and the second mask will mask the, the green, the previous set of colors and mask on top of it, the yellow. To break up the evenness of the, the model, I would like to introduce a little bit of noise and that noise is gonna be a bump map. The fabric in this case is gonna be completely covered in a fur coat. I have a full tutorial on how to go about this and if you want to learn more, check the link down below or uh, it, it will be in the end screen. So in the node editor, you can see that we have our hair shader. We're gonna switch this out for a principled hair BSDF. And with that now in place, I'm gonna introduce a texture pane. And because this is not gonna work with the normal texture coordinates and the mapping node, we have to introduce a attribute node. And when you have that, you can place it into your node editor. And right there in the text box, you can type surface underscore UV underscore coordinate. You can see that this generates some vector output and that is exactly what we need. We need to uh, get the vector, no, get the vector and place it into the vector input of our texture. Now you can see that our colors are coming through to the fur code. If you are fine with this, you can just leave it. But usually I will go ahead and create a slightly more detailed uh, hair shader. What I want to do is I want to create a slight color offset in our texture paint. Uh, for this, I'm gonna use a hue and saturation value node. And to get the offset, we are gonna use a curves info node. This curves info node has a random output and you can use the random output to drive the hue, but also the saturation value or whatever you like. In this case, I'm gonna drive the hue value. For now, it's gonna be a range from zero to one and that is gonna drive our texture that is red from actually um, gonna be blue to probably the other other way of the spectrum and that is gonna create a rainbow uh, fur coat for us. That is not what we want, so we have to limit it. And because we know that our original color is 0.5 on this spectrum, we can use that to our advantage. So in the mapping range node, or you can use a color ramp, we have to arrange it around the 0.5 mark. So uh, the further you go, the more color variation you introduce, but also um, you introduce maybe some unrealistic colors as well. If you thought that we were there, we are not because we are gonna change uh, a little bit more about the hair and especially the hair length. Along the hair length, we want to darken it a bit more. So for the roots, I want it to be a little bit darker and the tips are gonna be a little bit lighter. Um, the curve info node has a output that is called intercept. And this node will do exactly that. It creates a map from the root to the tip that is black to white. We can use this to drive, for example, a color ramp. You can color it even. Uh, use that texture or mask, however you like to look at it and 
overlay that or say multiply it on top of your original texture paint. I said it before, but I mentioned it again. There are four principles that will have you create a realistic hair system in no time. Uh, if you want to learn more, check out this video. As always, stay creative. I'll see you next time. Ciao.